Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the, the last integrative research seminar of the, of the season. And this is a, a kind of experiment that I, I suggest to the department to invite uh, researchers and professors from other departments than ours in order to open our mind and see potential collaborations with, uh, in that case, in that particular situation, with Jordi Galli. Jordi Galli is, is a catedratic full professor from the economics department. He's really a master. He has a very long CV that I am not going to read because it's... <laughs> And he, he got a PhD at the, the MIT, so he has been in close in contact with engineers. And he's also the director of the CREI, the Center for Research in International Economy. He's going to give a, a, that talk about the role of expectations in economics. And I think that there will be a, a many questions at the end of the presentation of Jordi. So Jordi, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for the invitation. This is uh, something different for me, so because I usually uh, speak in front of uh, economists, and so the nature of the of my talk will will, will also be very different. This is not uh, I'm not going to present uh, some recent uh, work of mine or anything like that. Um, but instead, uh, I guess the objective of my main objective uh, today, given that I take that most of you are non-economists, is to, is to uh, give you a bit of a, of a glimpse uh, of uh, some of the, of the tools and the concepts and methods that, that we use uh, in economics. And the, so that would be the, the, the general objective. And now the specific, the specific choice of a, of a, of a topic um, is because I think the, you know, this, this is a, a dimension of uh, economics that is very distinct, very characteristic of, of economics. And um, it's very important in order to, to understand many economic phenomena, and that's what I will try to, to argue uh, today. And it, it clearly makes it different from, what, from natural sciences, and that will be one of the um, basic points of my talk. And hence, it calls for you know, different ways of thinking. Um, uh, from the ones that uh, we may be used in, in, in natural sciences. It also gives me an excuse to, to you know, sneak in a bit of my, of my own research, recent research, which, which, is, um, which certainly makes use of, of, um, of some of the concepts and, and methods that, that I will talk about. So these are expectations in economics, the role of, the role of expectations. And Again, I think there will be questions at the end, some time for questions, but if you have a clarifying question, just don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask me, okay? So, uh, this is a distinction that I want to make from the start. Uh, the, the, the distinction, and again, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, an arbitrary distinction uh, um, between physical uh, systems uh, and, and social systems, okay? And again, there may be, many dimensions in which uh, those uh, systems or those worlds uh, can, can differ. But um, here is one. Uh, physical systems are made up of, uh, you know, purposeless uh, uh, matter, I guess. And it, they display, whatever behavior, interesting behavior they display, it's, it's uh, kind of mechanical. It's not purposeful. Okay? It's not the result of decisions that someone is making. Okay? Um, again, we're leaving human beings aside here. Okay? Think of physical systems without the intervention of human beings. Okay? And again, one way of representing this um, mathematically would be to think of a vector xt that would contain you know, a number of relevant uh, uh, state variables that evolves over time according to this difference equation where uh, z here is just a vector of exogenous variables. And again, here, what, what do we think of as an exogenous variable is all relative. No, it's typically, an exogenous variable is a measure of our ignorance. Okay? It means a variable that we're not trying to, 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 to explain, but if we, you know, if, we, if, if we went deeper, maybe this would be completely deterministic. Xt would be just a function of Xt minus one, and that's it, okay? In uh, social systems, on the other hand, um, you know, social systems by definition are, are made up of individuals, human beings, 
And individuals have objectives, have constraints, and make decisions that are guided by those objectives. Okay? So, and, um, so that in, it, in itself is interesting, but uh, what, I, uh, what I will try to emphasize in my talk is that some of those decisions in, um, involve uh, payoffs, okay? uh, gains of some different nature, pecuniary or non-pecuniary, that depend on other individuals' actions. Okay? So they don't exclusively depend on one's actions, but also on other uh, individuals' actions, which necessarily, if, if someone is, tries to you know, make an optimal decision, necessarily requires, that necessarily requires that that person forms expectations or beliefs about what others will be doing. Okay? Or if you want about what the outcome of others' uh, decisions will be. Okay? So that's how expectations come into play. So think of two environments, and I, I, I will give you, the, my talk essentially will be a list of examples, um, simple illustrations of both environments. The first example is a pure uh, static environment, so everything takes place simultaneously, if you want. And you have that um, the, the decision, some variable that someone has to decide on, say x, is a function of the expectation, this is the expectational operator, of a function that involves the average value of that variable for the rest of individuals, think of a large number of individuals, society, okay? and, and also some exogenous variables. Okay? So here, this individual okay, will have, in order to you know, think of this as a, an optimal decision rule okay, that comes from, comes from as, the, as, the, as the outcome of some maximization problem, and uh, it takes, may take this form. This is a typical form that it would take. Okay? Then it, in particular, I want to emphasize this, this dependence on the average decisions made by others. And, and, and in a dynamic environment, uh, um, okay, so this would be in a static environment. In a dynamic environment, we can, we can have a, um, a representation of, of the equilibrium of a, a social system, say an economy, okay, which takes this form. Okay, which differs from this in the sense that it involves not only you know, the past values of this vector of state variables and, and some exogenous variables, but also it involves the expectations okay, or some, some beliefs about uh, the distribution of that, ver that vector of variables in the following period. Okay? And hence, recursively, if you think of this solving this recursively forward, it involves expectations and beliefs about things that will happen uh, you know, far into the future. Okay? So, uh, the, 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 what I want to illustrate through a, a series of examples in, in, in my talk today is that the, this, this fact, the fact that you know, some decisions some, and some economic phenomena are functions of expectations about future, um, uh, expectations about others' decisions or expectations about future behavior of the economy, leads to some interesting implications for the properties of the solutions of this, of this, uh, you know, of this uh, say, equilibrium conditions, and hence for the, for, for the properties of, of outcomes uh, that we should observe in, 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 in these social systems, okay? that you wouldn't find in, in what I would call mechanical, mechanical systems like this. Okay? So that, that's, that's the, the, my plan. Okay, so here are just a list. This is how I will organize my talk. First, I will just give you an example of a, of a simple economy in a static environment. Everything happens in a, in a single period. And it's an economy which uh, displays what we call, economists call, uh, strategic complementarities. And then we will look at, the, uh, at other examples that are closer to what uh, I, I do personally in my research. Um, which involve uh, dynamic environments, okay? So for the ch for behaviors of systems over, over time, and I'll, I'll give you four examples if we have time. So one is an optimal consumption saving model, which is a canonical model of, of optimization by a, an individual. Then I will give you examples of three of two phenomena, uh, two, two phenomena that uh, emerge uh, in these kind of systems: uh, sunspot fluctuations and bubbles. 
These are terms that economists uh, use. And then I'll, I'll, I'll point to something that is very much uh, uh, an illustration of, of, this, of this phenomena that is taking place, you know, in, it, 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 that plays a, a, has been playing a central role in monetary policy in, since, the, since the financial crisis, okay? And, and the way of implementing monetary policy by central banks. So this is what is known as forward guidance uh, policies, which is an example of the unconventional monetary policies that central banks are, are, have, have been forced to adopt for reasons that I will explain. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with some, some uh, remarks and lessons. So here, let me start with this uh, model uh, that I call a model of strategic complementarities. Okay, and I'll, I'll... So think of an economy that has a very large number of individuals. Okay? They maybe can re be represented by, by uh, the unit interval, okay? so an infinite number of individuals, all of, all of whom are identical. Okay? This will obviously simplify the analysis. Okay? They are exactly identical. Okay? And let's assume this will be very abstract, okay? but, we, we, but all of you will be able to think of, of uh, maybe real-world examples in which this may be relevant. Okay? Think of the individual's problem. Okay? For, uh, each, each, each person makes decisions individually, okay? in, in a way, non-cooperatively, okay? in a decentralized way. And the individual's problem consists of maximizing this function u. You, you can think of, uh, we, we economists call it utility, but think of any, any function that gives the payoffs or the rewards that that, that individual will have for the decision that uh, he or she will make. And that um, utility okay, depends on, on a variable that that individual chooses, x, okay, that's a scalar. Okay. The average value of that variable chosen by other uh, individuals in the economy, okay, and z, which is a, just a, an, exogenous, an exogenous variable, or a set of exogenous variables. Okay? And these are, these are the assumptions that we make on, on some of the properties of this function, like, which are important. Okay? So this, this second derivative with respect to the first argument, I don't know, this is notation that we often use, I guess it's self-explanatory. Okay? This would be the second derivative. That guarantees that this will have a, a, a maximum. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an important uh, assumption. It, it, it means that you know, an increase, let's call x the level of activity. Yeah? An increase in the average level of activity by others increases my rewards. It's something good for me. That's, that's why we call it, that's the assumption of strategic complementarities. Okay? There are positive spillovers okay, from others' actions into to, to, to my rewards. And this is also a critical one. The cross derivative is positive. Okay? This means that an increase in, in the level of activity, in others' level of activity, increases the, re, uh, the, the effect, the marginal uh, uh, reward from my own level of activity. Okay? So at the margin, okay, it increases my incentive to increase my level of activity. Okay? Maybe because uh, it, it, uh, others, other people's efforts make, make me more productive myself, okay, at the margin. Okay, so think of this one possibility. Oh, by the way, and this, we're going um, to assume that each individual takes x bar, the, the average, as given, which is a reasonable assumption, if there are a lot of individuals, so whatever your decisions, uh, you, whatever decisions you make, do not affect the average okay, in the economy. And z, by assumption, is taken as given because it's an exogenous, it's an exogenous variable. So think maybe of uh, uh, um, no, a researcher, like uh, most of you, who cares about you know, the quality of his or her research, uh, visibility, impact, and so on. And that, of course, depends, depends very much on one's effort. Okay, that would be x, but it also is a factor of you know, the environment in which you are, and the quality of the research in whatever department you are, and so on. So directly or indirectly, it depends also on the average effort that your colleagues uh, put into, into, into their own research. Okay? So that's, there's this, what we economists would call a, a positive externality associated with uh, one's uh, effort. Yeah. So, um if the behavior is not selfish and one wants to maximize society's well-being, we'll is that possible with this? Yes, yes, we'll talk about this. That will be a reference, okay? But this is the case that we're interested because we want to think, we want, to, uh, we, this is 
a, a positive description of the world when we want to think of, of individuals behaving like this, and let's see if this leads to some inefficiencies or not. Okay? So the optimality condition for this problem is uh, straightforward. Okay? You take the derivative with respect to x, you equate it to 0, this is well behaved, there will be a, a single uh, uh, solution to this equation, and we can write it, we can write it like this. Okay? So the optimal x okay, is a function of x bar and z. And it's an increasing function, in particular, it's an increasing function of x bar. So we, this, this would be um, a picture that would describe one possible environment. Here I have restricted x to be, lie between 0 and 1. That's not really important. Okay, so this, the red line, give, let me call this the reaction function. Okay, so that's represented by the red line. Okay, so the individual, this, this red line gives us the, the optimal individual choice given the average choice of the other members of the of society or the, or the group, okay? And of course, everyone is identical here, so everyone will make uh, the same decision, and uh, it will have to be the case that, that in, in equilibrium, that decision corresponds to also to the average decision of the group, okay? So the solution will, or the equilibrium, will correspond to the point in which this, this line Okay, the reaction function intersects the 45 degree line. And so we will have, this will be this equilibrium. So this is what economists call the Nash, a Nash equilibrium, okay, in which if every individual uh, behaves optimally, taking as given the behavior of other individuals. And here in this simple case, everyone is identical, so we can look at what is known as the symmetric Nash equilibrium, in which the individual decisions has to correspond to the average decision, okay? Very good, but this is not, the only possible uh, environment, okay, we can have a situation like this, okay? And we can have a situation like this, and here we see that there are three possible outcomes in this example, okay? And the three are consistent with this notion of a Nash equilibrium, okay? That means that if individual, an individual, I'm an individual, if I believe that on average my colleagues, you know, will choose this particular value, xl, okay, it is optimal for me to choose xl, okay? And the same for xm and xh. Think of this as low, medium, and high levels of activity, okay? And the three are equilibria, okay? Equilibria in the sense that no one has an incentive to deviate from, from that outcome given what, other, what others do, okay? Now, uh, where could this, uh, so where could this situation, how could this situation emerge? I mean, this could be the world, the representation of the world as it is, but also we can think, you can think of a situation like this, okay, in which there is a single equilibrium, but there is a shock to Z, okay, the exogenous variable, that brings down this reaction function, okay, and then we go from a situation in which there is a single equilibrium to one in which there are three equilibria. Okay? And this has important implications for, for our ability to predict how you know, the economy or this, this, this uh, system will respond to a shock. Because you know, if, if, we, you know, if the shock was small, I think I have a picture like this, okay? if the shock was small and the reaction function shifted a little, you know, we could use sim local methods to, 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 uh, to, to, to predict the response of, of the economy to that, per to that shock. But if the shock is large, then we're in a situation like this, and we don't know, there's no, we, there, there's no way to tell ex ante which of the three possible outcomes will emerge. The three are consistent with equilibria, okay? So formally, okay, well, we have this. Remember, this, this was the, okay, the, the optimality condition that has to be satisfied for indi each individual. The, 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 Nash, the symmetric Nash equilibria are defined as solutions to this such that you know, x equals to x bar, and let me just use a, a star, an asterisk, to, to, to refer to the fact that they are equilibria, okay? So any solutions to this equation will, will, be Nash, uh, will, will qualify as Nash equilibria, and as we have seen by this simple uh, diagram, there is room for multiple, multiple solutions. But here's something that is more interesting, okay? Those solutions can be welfare ranked, okay? In particular, one can show that, in this example that I've given you, that if, if, if one takes the equilibrium with a high level of activity, 
okay, is that is if x h is larger than x l, which is what, what, what was the case in the simple example that I gave you earlier, okay, then it must be the case that utility in this, in this equilibrium with a high level of activity is larger than utility in, in the equilibrium, in the Nash equilibrium with a low level of activity, okay? And this can be uh, is proved uh, easily. I mean, I'll leave this as, a, as an exercise if you want to think about it. It's, you, you just have to, given the properties of the utility function that I've given you, you just have the, the simple way to prove is to show that this point here is more desirable than this point here. This point here is the one that has, uh, in which the average is xh, but your decision is xl, okay? And this is true by what we call revealed preferences, because you know the, the, this individual could always have chosen this point, but has preferred to choose this point. So this, this, this must be more desirable than this point that I'm pointing here. And on, in addition, this point here is more desirable than this. And the reason is that uh, that utility function is increasing in x in x um, bar. Okay, the, the second derivative, the um, derivative with respect to the second argument was positive. The positive is spillover's assumption. Okay, so that's that's this. So what happens if the the economy gets stuck here? Well, we have a case in what, what that we call a coordination failure. Okay, um, there 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 are two alternative outcomes that are more desirable from a social point of view. But somehow, no one has an incentive, okay, unless, unless there's some external force to, 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 to switch to the other post outcomes, even though those could be sustainable. It's different. I, I'm sure that many of you uh, may be familiar with the prisoner's dilemma. Okay? In the prisoner's dilemma, the, the outcome is, is inefficient, is, un, is undesirable for both prisoners. Okay? Uh, but there's no other uh, outcome, and there's no other Nash equilibrium. Okay? Whereas here, we have a situation that I think is more interesting. There are other outcomes that could potentially be sustainable as Nash equilibria. Okay? Very good. Um, let, me, let me move on. I mean, there are some caveats to this. It is a very simple example in which everyone is identical and so on. I'm assuming that people can form exact beliefs of what, about what others do. There's no uncertainty about what X bar is when you choose your x. Okay? Now, there are other information structures, and here is a reference, Morris and Shin. At the end of the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll list some references in case you, any of you is interested, which shows that you know, under more general assumptions, if, if the, depending on how the information structure is, if there is imperfect information and asymmetric information, this multiplicity may, may, may go away, okay? But again, my, my here I wanted to show the, the result that I think is interesting, which is the, the, the one in which the multiplicity exists. And here is, the, let's go back to the, uh, so, um, well, the, the uh, cooperative, what we could think of as the cooperative equilibrium. The way economists think about the cooperative equilibrium is, is well, we, we, we uh, we think of a benevolent dictator. Okay, the benevolent dictator, okay, chooses, makes decisions for individuals and gives orders as to what they have to do, but in a benevolent way. That is, in order to maximize the welfare of society, not in order to maximize uh, his his own uh, welfare. Okay, so in that sense, it's a benevolent dictator, or we also call it the social planner. Okay, so what? Suppose that that social planner wants to maximize the average utility of all these individuals. Okay, so that would be the average utility. This is individual i. Okay, so we're integrating over i. But now the social planner recognizes something that the individual doesn't recognize. Okay, that x, uh, that the average, average x, is related. There is a link between you know each individual's level of activity and the average x. Whereas the individual takes the average x as given, okay. So as a result of that, now if you if you you know take the derivative, and you impose the the symmetric, uh, um, well, if you if you derive the op, the optimality condition for for this, which one can show that involves a sym, uh, sy symmetry in the sense that everyone will do the same, you you get this. And x e now refers to the efficient level, socially efficient level of, of uh, effort or activity, okay? It has to, has to satisfy this condition. And now contrast it with the Nash equilibrium, okay? Which looked like this. So, you, so one, one thing that you, we, we see immediately from this comparison is that the Nash equilibrium will be inefficient. 
necessarily. Okay? Because as long as U2, U, U2 is positive, okay? as long as this, there, is, there are these spillovers, okay? actually it could also be negative, if those spillovers were negative, we could also would ha would have an inefficiency, but as long as this is different from zero, as long as there are spillovers, okay, the X star, the Nash equilibrium, will differ be different from Xe. Okay? So that's one result. And not only that, but one can show uh, that X star, that is the, the level of uh, effort or level of activity in the Nash equilibrium, is always less, uh, in this example, eh, than in the efficient outcome. That is, it would be optimal, it would be optimal if somehow some external force uh, pushed everyone in the society to work harder, to make more effort. That would be desirable for, for everyone, at least at the margin, not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to go all the way, uh, say, to x equal 1 in my example or not. Okay? Very good. So this is a, a first example that I wanted to, to, to show you that illustrates the importance of expectations or beliefs. In this case, it's an aesthetic environment and the expectations or, belie or beliefs are with respect to what others will do, okay? not expectations about the future. Okay? So those expectations, I mean, to the extent that someone could influence those expectations, a government or some external force, that could actually help the economy uh, you know, um, uh, coordinate on the, on the most desirable, sustainable equilibrium, assuming that it's not possible to have the, the socially efficient one because we, don't, we, we want people to, to decide freely uh, um, what they want to do, okay, individually, okay. Very good. Now let me turn to examples that involve, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, decisions over time, you know, involve intertemporal decisions. Okay, and there are four examples. Let's see how far can I go. So this is a, this is a standard example in, in, in dynamic economic theory. Okay, it's like the canonical model. So let me show it to you without getting into the details, but at least it will give you an idea of, 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 of um, of what is the, you know, how, how economists formulate in the simplest possible case the problem of, uh, the intertemporal problem of an individual, okay? So think of an economy, an, an, an individual, sorry, that wants to maximize this objective function. So think of you as the utility, you know, the reward, the, you know, the degree of happiness or whatever, which depends on the level of consumption of that individual. Think of, th think of an economy in which there is a single good, okay? And, and, but, of course, the individual lives for many periods, okay? So, um, total happiness depends on the, uh, is ex assumed to depend on the expected discounted sum of utilities at different periods, okay? Beta is the discount factor between zero and one. That means that, you know, I put more weight on what I consume today than on what I will consume uh, 10 years from now, okay? That seems reasonable. And the utility function satisfies these standard properties. It's increasing in the level of consumption. The more consumption, the better I, off I am. But it's concave. It means that the, the marginal utility of consumption is decreasing. Okay? After you know, eating 10 cakes, the 11th cake well, could actually, may actually violate this assumption in the case of the, uh, the example I just gave. And this is subject to some constraint, a, a budget constraint, or a sequence of budget constraints, because we have one for every period that looks like this. So, let me start from, well, A is financial wealth in period T plus 1, at the beginning of period T plus 1, okay? What is financial wealth at the beginning of period, at, um, period T plus 1? It's equal to financial wealth at the beginning of period T plus whatever income that individual uh, gets in period T minus taxes, okay? Think of taxes as lump sum taxes, not proportional to income, just for simplicity, minus consumption, okay? And all that is invested by the individual is whatever finance wealth there is after income, taxes, and consumption, it's invested at an interest rate R. So the financial wealth in period T plus one will be given by this. Okay? Now, uh, I want uh, proof here, well, but maybe if, if, if you move this to the left-hand side, you can think of this, you can, this is a difference equation that you can iterate forward, and you take expectations, and you derive this this single, okay, you can collapse this sequence of uh, period budget constraints into a single bu budget constraint that we call intertemporal budget constraint that looks like this. 
And that can be expressed in words in a simple way. It says that um, the discounted sum of consumption, of current and future consumption, has to be equal to today's wealth, okay, suppose that we're in period T now, okay, plus the discounted sum of after-tax income. Okay, so that's the constraint that effectively, that summarizes all these constraints, okay? Very good. And now let's look at the optimal behavior of this individual. So think of this, imagine that this individual, so this is a simple heuristic argument. Think of this individual following an optimal plan, okay? So if the individual follows an optimal plan, plan one that maximizes that, uh, that uh, this, this uh, objective function, any deviation, any small deviation from the optimal plan cannot lead to a, an increase in, in, in that objective function. So think of a, a deviation in which the individual consumes one unit less of consumption in period T, invests that, those savings, and with the um, money that that individual gets in the following period, it, it increases uh, his consumption, okay? And it keeps consumption in all other periods unchanged. Okay, so this, I claim that, that, well, this is the loss of consumption that the individual would experience in period T, but that will be compensated by the additional consumption in period T plus 1, which will be equal to 1 plus R, okay, times the discounted, properly discounted, marginal utility of that consumption, okay, and of course, marginal utility of that consumption is not known as of time t. So what this um, means is this is the expectation of this marginal utility conditional on all the information available at time t. But the individual can form an expectation of that marginal utility. Okay? Now, just to, to simplify um, a bit uh, the algebra, suppose that the product of these two equals 1. Okay? We get this very simple, oh, and, and assume that utility is quadratic. Okay? Uh, so this is linear, this would be linear in C, it would be decreasing and, and linear in C. Then this, this optimality condition, okay, can be written like this, okay, which is, it's, it, it's very intuitive. It says that at any point in time, the consumer will choose a level of consumption such that that level of consumption is expected to remain unchanged over time. So the, consu the consumer wants to smooth consumption as much as possible over time, okay? That's because the concavity of the utility function penalizes fluctuations in consumption. There will be fluctuations because there will be shocks, income will increase, will decrease in a way that is completely unexpected, and the consumer will have to adjust the cons cons his consumption every period, but so that this is satisfied. Now, you recursively, you can see that this will also be true. Okay? Now, you can plug this into the into this intertemporal budget constraint to replace these expectations, do some simple algebra, and we get what we call a consumption function. Consumption function tells us the optimal level of consumption as a function of all this stuff. Okay? And what is this? This, this is today's financial wealth. Okay? This is a constant. Will be a beta, typically it will be close to 1, so this will be small. But this, this is financial wealth today. And this is the, the expected discounted, um, the, uh, the, the discounted sum of expected future tax uh, sorry, future after-tax income, okay? And we can see very clearly and very explicitly in this case that we have a forward-looking decision. In, a, in, in other words, a decision which depends very explicitly on expectations about the evolution of some variables in the future. In this case, expectations about future income, okay? And this should be intuitive, you know, think of uh, you know, yourself if you know that you will get a raise next year, okay? And if you want to, to smooth consumption over time, you will start consuming. If you have access to financial markets, that's the assumption here that that person can borrow or, or, or lend at, a, at an interest rate R, you will, you, you, you will start consuming uh, more today. Okay? And there are many other examples in, that uh, one can think of in which expectations, in, sorry, play, uh, expectations play a very important role in decisions, even um, you know, all kinds of decisions, uh, especially in environments and not necessarily in environments that, well, this is intertemporal by, by nature, this consumption, optimal consumption and savings plan, but also in environments in which it's not so obvious. For instance, think of a, a firm that sets prices, okay, and uh, um, for the good it produces. Now, suppose that there is a small cost of adjusting the price. Well, that price, and we see that all the time, no? that, that price will not be changed continuously. The price, 
you know, remains unchanged for a number of periods, and then you know, there is a discrete change, and then you, know, you go to the store and, or, 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 and you see, oh, look, they have raised the price of this good that I was uh, buying all the time. No? Think of uh, newspapers or things that you know, their, their price may remain unchanged for a, num for a very long number of periods. When the, when the firm sets the price, necessarily the decision, the price setting decision, has to be a forward-looking decision because it recognizes that it won't have, it will not adjust the price in the immediate future and hence it has to take into account cost factors, demand factors and so on that, that will be relevant in the future, not only in this period. Okay? Very good. So now let, let's look at some implication of this. This is a, um, some, uh, this is a, a paper by uh, Robert Lucas Nobel uh, laureate who had in, an amazing impact in, 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 in economics. It's an old paper, 1976. But let me give you the basic idea. Uh, I think it's, it's really powerful not to see the importance of uh, expectations and modeling expectations right. So this is the consumption function that we just derived. Okay? Now imagine, again, just for simplicity, that income follows an AR1 process. Okay? And the same for taxes. Follow these simple autoregressive uh, processes. Okay? And, well, then, you know, these expectations we can write as a function of today's income and the expectation of future taxes, we can write it as a function of today's taxes. So doing some straightforward algebra, we get this a specification for the consumption function. A linear function of today's financial wealth, today's income, and today's taxes. And now, let me, give you, let me just give some arbitrary values, but not crazy values, to, 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 to some of the parameters. In particular, suppose that beta is 0.95, the discount factor, the persistence of income is 0.5, and the persistence of taxes is 1. So taxes follow a random walk. Okay? In, and that has, been, that, has been, that has characterized the behavior of the economy over the recent past. Okay? In which case, if you plug these numbers here, you get this consumption function. This is what we would call an empirical consumption function. Okay? Very good. And now suppose that a government wants to evaluate the impact of a tax cut. Okay? They, want to, they are considering to, ta uh, to increase taxes or to, to lower taxes, okay? a change in taxes. Um, but they, for whatever reason, the, the, this tax cut has to be temporary. It will be just a one-period tax cut. Okay? Um, okay, so what would be the traditional approach before Lucas, okay, would be the following, okay, we have estimated, no, we have uh, gathered data and so on, and we have used, you know, standard uh, statistical methods, we have estimated this equation, which is the one that characterizes the economy before this intervention, okay, so I look at this equation and I say, look, if I increase taxes by one unit, by say one euro, consumption will be reduced by, by one euro, and that's my evaluation of, of, of the impact that the change in taxes uh, will have. Okay, now, the, but this is incorrect, and that's the Lucas critique, because the correct approach recognizes that there, there is a regime change. Now we're going to, um, uh, we're considering a, a, a policy intervention which involves a temporary adjustment in taxes, whereas historically, okay, I, I, we had Per, uh, ch changes in taxes that were permanent because you know taxes followed a random walk and now it will be purely temporary. So the right way to approach the problem is to recognize this change in regime. Now rho tau, the, this parameter is effectively zero because the change will be purely temporary and this is the right consumption function to, to apply. So now you can see that the implications are very different. Okay? This temporary adjust change in taxes will have a tiny effect on consumption. Okay? So the general lesson from this is that you know, there is a, a, one has to disting, uh, um, clearly distinguish between uh, what we could call reduced for, form coefficients, okay? the ones that we would estimate, say if we, if we, we would obtain if we were to estimate a, 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 an equation like this using data, and structural parameters. The structural parameters are parameters that are invariant to policy. Okay? Now, some of these coefficients, for instance, this one here, okay, depends on the characteristics of policy, in particular of this tau, uh, uh, this rho tau. Okay? If we change rho tau, this coefficient will, will change. In this case, you know, it, it goes from 1 to 0 .0, 0, 0 0.05, which means that there is no substitute for theory if we want to evaluate the consequences of a change in regime. 
Okay, not the, the, the consequences of a, a single policy intervention. Now, okay, I'm not going to raise taxes by three instead of by four. No, a change in regime. Okay, we cannot just use past data. Okay, so that would be an, an example. Let me give you a, another one. This is, an, is what uh, sunspot fluctuations. What are sunspot fluctuations? This is a, just, a, a, I guess, a, a stupid uh, name that we economists give to uh, fluctuations that are driven, fluctuations in the economy, that are driven purely by self-fulfilling uh, revisions in expectations, okay? Changes in people's mood, okay? So think of the following. Suppose that, again, this is a very simple example, just to illustrate the mathematical structure of, the, of, of this, of this um, sunspot fluctuations. Think, imagine that the investment of, by firm I, XTI, depends on the expectations uh, that this firm has about ag the, the aggregate demand, about you know, how well the economy will be doing in, in, in the following period, okay? Because you know, if you, you need to have enough capital to meet demand, and if the economy is going to improve, you need to invest today in period T in order to have the capital that will be so necessary to meet demand, okay? And now suppose that output, if, so this, think of this as aggregate output in the economy. Aggregate output in the economy is the sum of two components, investment itself, no, investment of the firm, it's a source of demand for output, okay, for output for uh, demand for capital goods, plus some other term, okay, and this, think of this as all being deviations from steady state. And let's just for simplicity assume that this term is unpredictable and in its expectation as of time t is zero, okay. Now plug this in here, okay, combine the two equations and we get this equation that describes the evolution of investment over time. So any solution, any solution to this, um, to this difference equation, um, say that is not explosive, let's rule out explosive uh, solutions because those would violate some, eventually would violate some constraints that I haven't made explicitly here. Any solution to this difference equation would be consistent with equilibrium. Now there is an obvious solution to this, which is zero, x zero at all times, okay? So suppose that x zero is, x is zero at all times, again, these in deviations from steady state, right? that doesn't mean that investment has to be zero. And, and then if x is zero, y would be equal to z over time. So there will be small fluctuations in output, um, completely unpredictable, okay? So it will be, output will be like, a, this, I guess, this a martingale difference process, that's what this thing, this thing is called, no? And that's it. But the question is, are there other solutions? Or n, okay, so let's, let's see. So here I have rewritten this equation, but changing the timing, okay, to make it easy. Now, suppose that alpha is greater than one. Okay, here we don't know where alpha comes from because I haven't derived this from first principles, but let's assume that alpha equals, is greater than one. So one can check that this, okay, is also a non-explosive solution to this uh, difference equation, as long as this uh, C, T, is completely unpredictable. It's a Martingale difference process. It's completely unpredictable, okay? And you can check it, the simplest way to check it is take expectations, conditional on information at time T minus one on both sides of this equation, and you will see that this is, sati this is satisfied, okay? So in this case, we can have persistence fluctuations. Okay, so what, sh how shall we interpret this C, T? This is what we call a sunspot shock. It could be anything. It could be anything. It just has to coordinate expectations. As long, that's why it's called a sunspot. A sunspot is something that, in principle, should not have any effect on the economy, but you know, it may coordinate expectations. You know, every, everyone, some, some people, everyone looks at a signal and say, "Look, this means that you know the economy will be doing, will be improving tomorrow. So let's all invest and so on." Okay. So, and we can have actually uh, persistence because alpha could be close to, could be close to one. So this, 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 this would be non-explosive fluctuations, but highly persistent, okay? Very good. Now, these sunspot fluctuations are generally, again, this, I haven't, this was not a full-fledged model, uh, but are generally undesirable because they, they, they are not warranted. It's not that they are not the results of uh, a consequence of fundamental shocks to the economy, say technology shocks or other shocks that could warrant some adjustment in the level of investment, in the level of output, or changes in preferences of individuals. No, they are just the result of self revisions of expectations that become self-fulfilling. Self and hence, they, are, you know, they will have negative effects on welfare for society. So 
Let me give you, in, in some work uh, that I did with uh, Rich Clark and Mark Gertler uh, some time ago, we um, estimated a model for the US economy and showed that, well, in that model, okay, whether the possibility of those sunspot fluctuations uh, existed or not depended on the rule that the central bank was following. Okay, and the, some coefficients in a rule that the central bank was f following, was assumed to follow when setting the interest rate. That's the way we usually describe the behavior of central banks. No? It's following rules for the setting of, of, the, of the interest rate. Okay. So it turns out that the, we estimated the, that rule for different periods. And for the 60s and 70s, we showed that the estimated coefficients of the, that rule imply, when embedded in the model, that sunspot fluctuations may emerge. And that provides an alternative interpretation to the macroeconomic instability of the, of the late 60s and 70s in the US. That was a period in which there was a lot of instability in output, in inflation, and so on. Okay? So it's, it's, it's an interpretation that is different from the traditional one that typically focuses on, oil, on, 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 on shocks to the price of oil, which obviously are fundamental shocks that by themselves could explain some of those fluctuations. But this is one that, that is based on people becoming optimistic or pessimistic and, and, and those expectations uh, uh, becoming self-fulfilling. Let me give you another example. I have time for another example, do you think? Yeah, sure. Yeah, OK. So bubbles, OK? Yeah, I'm sure that you all hear, you've, you hear about bubbles all the time, bubble <laughs> in the housing market. And, you know, bubbles seem to be uh, everywhere in, 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 the, in the press, in, in the media, typically. Well, it's a free world, so people can uh, use those terms whichever way they want. But uh, here I will show you the way we use the term bubble in, in, in asset price theory in, in, in economics. Okay? So um, think of um, two assets. Okay? So there is a, a, one bond, um, a bond or a deposit, if you want, that is riskless, no risk. And it matures after one period. If you invest one, one euro today, and you get the following period, you get one plus r euros. r is positive. Okay? And then uh, another asset, which is risky, let's, call, let's assume a stock in a firm. Okay? It has a price QT, and it pays a stream of dividends, which is st stochastic. Okay? So very good. Now, here's a simple arbitrage condition that has to be satisfied under some assumptions, risk, neut risk neutrality, and so on. Let me not go into that. But it's, it, it will make sense, OK? This to you, I hope. So that individual can, suppose that individual um, can, can invest, uh, thinking of investing, is considering of, him, of buying one share in, in that firm, OK? So that for that, if uh, that individual buys uh, that share, OK? The ex what's the expected payoff the following period? Well, it's the expected dividend that the share will pay the following period, plus the price of the share, because that individual can resell, resell the share. Okay? So that's the expected payoff. But the alternative use is to put the money, the same money, in, in a deposit, or to purchase a, you know, a government bond, which is riskless. And then what will you get in the following period? You will get QT, the, the, the investment you're making today, times 1 plus r. OK? Very good. Now, any solution, this is a difference equation, again. It involves expectations. OK? Um, so any solution to this difference equation um, that is, remains bounded, OK? Because uh, you know, if q became infinite, q cannot be negative, because the negative price is not possible. And q cannot be infinite, because it would take over all the resources in the world. So, that, so any, any solution that remains bounded, OK, um, or that it grows at less than the, the growth of the economy as a whole, is a, is a legitimate equilibrium uh, value for the price of the stock, QT. So let me give you a solution to, to this difference equation. And this is the one, I don't, I'm, I'm sure that some of you may have taken some introductory finance courses as, uh, at some point. It's the solution that is taught in those courses. Okay? It's a fundamental solution. So QT equals what we, I'm going to call the fundamental value of, of the stock. Okay? And the, what's the fundamental value of the stock? It's defined as this, the present discounted value of expected dividends. Okay? And you can check, okay, I'm not going to prove this, but you could write this recursively. You can check that this, okay, this, this QF defined like this, effectively satisfies this difference equation. So it's a solution to this. It's a fundamental solution. But 
Is it the only solution? No. Let me define the bubble component. And this is what economists call the bubble, the bubble component of an asset or, or, or the bubble component of the price of an asset. It's the difference between the observed price of the asset and the fundamental component defined like this. Okay? So are there any solutions to this difference equation such that the bubble is different from zero? Well, it turns out that yes, okay? as long as the bubble oops, satisfies this, this difference equation. So take any solution, take the fundamental solution for that difference equation, add it QB that satisfies this, and you can check that it will always satisfy it. It, that it will also satisfy this. Okay? Equivalently, we can write it like this. Okay? So, as long, so there will be a solution in which the price has a bubble component as long as the bubble component grows in expectation at the same rate, at the, uh, at the interest rate. Okay? And this has interesting implications. That's some, the implications that I explored in, in some recent papers. Because it says that, look, if, the central, central banks, as you know, can influence okay, the, the interest rates. Okay? And you know, many people have called uh, for central banks to raise interest rates if they see a bubble emerging, okay, just to calm markets or whatever. Okay? What this is suggesting is that if the central bank increases the interest rate when the bubble is, in, a bubble is emerging, at least on average, that is in expectation, it may increase the growth rate of that bubble. Okay? At least if the bubble is a bubble, you know, it's a, what we call a rational asset price bubble, which is a bubble that satisfies this condition that is consistent with a, a rational expectations equilibrium, and so on. Okay? So at least it points, you know, that result points to, to a potential pitfall of these policies that you know, they seem intuitive and so on, but you know, when, once you analyze them, you see that there are some risks associated with them. Okay? So let me, uh, can I talk about forward guidance or shall I conclude? Five minutes. Five minutes, five minutes. okay, so no more than five minutes. Forward guidance, uh, just to give you a, a real world example of today in which expectations are critical, okay? As you know, as a result of the financial crisis, um, you know, central banks have responded very aggressively in order to stimulate the economy, no? Uh, uh, and the way they do that normally is to lower interest rates. Okay? But interest rates have a lower bound, a natural lower bound, nominal interest rates, which is zero. Okay? Why? Well, who would want to extend the loan at a negative interest rate when you can keep that money in, in, a, in a safe box, not if, if not in your pocket, in a safe box at a zero interest rate? Okay? So that's a natural bound. It turns out that you know, some central banks have been able to go a little beyond zero uh, because obviously there is a cost to keeping a lot of money in one's pocket or on, under the mattress. Okay, very good. But let's for the for the uh, for the sake of the argument, let's let's assume that this this is it. Now, uh, uh, the economy, the aggregate demand, and, and 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 the way the economy is stimulated is not through this interest rate that the central bank chooses. What really matters are the interest rates that individuals and firms have access to. Let's call them long-term interest rates, which are the interest rates on loans that go beyond one day, because the interest rate that the central bank chooses is, a, is a, an interest rate that it's just for inter, in, um, overnight operations and so on, or one-week operations. And this long-term interest rate is nothing okay, uh, than a, 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 an average of expected short-term interest rates, the ones that the central bank chooses, over the life of the, this long-term loan or long-term bond. Okay? So now you can see that even if, the, even if uh, the central bank has hit the zero lower bound, as all, all central banks in advanced economies have during the af aftermath of the crisis, there is still some room for central banks to influence the economy, which is to affect expectations. They cannot lower the interest rate today, but they can try to influence expectations about what the interest rate that the central bank will set in the future. Okay, and here you have some uh, um, statements by the FOMC, that's the, the committee and the Federal Reserve in the US that uh, chooses interest rates. Okay, so things like this. The committee anticipates that weak economic conditions are likely to warrant exceptionally low levels of the federal funds rate, that's the interest rate that they choose, for some time. 
And then later on, when things get even worse, they actually make it contingent to, to developments in the economy. Okay? The committee decided to keep the target range for the federal funds up, and the, uh, that is very low, close to zero, okay? as long as the unemployment rate remains above 6.5% uh, and, and so on. So they, the central bank is try to, trying to manage expectations, again, about future interest rates in order to stimulate the economy. So that's a, um, another example. So just to conclude, uh, now all the examples that I have shown you have two assumptions, rational expectations, okay? Expectations were not just arbitrary, okay? They were consistent with the equilibrium of the model. That's something that you know, to, to, to show I would have had to go example by example and, and make it clear when, when I had made that assumption. But that's clear. And also there's all the examples where there was a representative agent. Everyone was the same and all the equilibria were symmetric and so on. Now things can get much more complicated you know, if people are different and then you have to form expectations about what other people will do and those people, uh, other individuals are different and they form their own expectations. So you have to form expectations about the expectations that other people will form and so on. So it gets very complicated, okay? Um, there are also interesting lessons for policy here. Policy uh, takes interesting dimensions. One important uh, dimension is that, well, the first thing that a, a good policy should do is to rule out this indeterminacy, because this indeterminacy is clearly not desirable in the economic world. Not this, this unnecessary, unwarranted fluctuation serve no, no purpose. So any policy rule should be a rule that eliminates that. Also, it points to the role of expectations management. Governments can play a role and in, in, can improve uh, uh, allocations, can improve the economy by managing expectations, by coordinating expectations and so on. And here, of course, the role of credibility is important. No? The governments may, see, may, may make promises, it's just for the Federal Reserve, the statements I showed you about what they will do in the future. But you know, they may not be believed. So credibility is very important here. Okay? And just as a, a final remark, I mean, uh, it's clear that uh, you know, economic outcomes uh, are, are the result of interactions of decisions made by a lot of individuals, and those decisions on top depend on direct people, individu individuals' expectations about what others will do and so on. So this is extremely, extremely complex. So I think that the need, uh, the, the, I think the search for a quantitative model that would explain the world, the economic world, I think, personally, I think it's completely hopeless, okay? but. Uh, uh, because it's too, it's too complex, it's too complex. And expectations are an important source of that complexity. But I think there is room, and, and that's what most of us try to do, for uh, you know, simple models that emphasize specific mechanisms, okay, a, and completely ignoring other mechanisms that uh, can provide um, useful insights for policy making. Okay? And, and can point to, to, you know, to, to mechanisms then that maybe other people had not thought about possible policy responses that other people had not thought. But in any event, uh, the, clearly these, uh, the, the, the expectations are an important source of complexity, okay? but as I have tried to show you, uh, they are also a source of phenomena that you won't find in the physical sciences and during the physical world. And I think those phenomena are really fascinating. I'm fascinated by those phenomena, and I think it's what makes uh, economics uh, interesting, if anything. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jordi, for your, your presentation. I think it has been very clear. Uh, now it's time for questions. Angel is having question. OK. Can you wait for a while? The microphone is coming. Yeah, thank you for this uh, really great talk. Uh, so as an engineer, I, I cannot help, but, help but, wonder, uh, but wonder what would happen in a society made of robots rather than humans. And, um, and whether then economics would become more like engineering. That's an extreme setting, but it is probably the case that decisions will be increasingly made by machines more than humans. So I wonder whether you can comment on the impact you think this will have in, no. in, on economics and whether people are thinking about that already on different tools or... or that's, that's, a very, that's a very interesting question. I, I haven't uh, thought about... Actually, when I pre was preparing this talk, and uh, no, I was trying to, to, to think of the motivation. I wanted to talk about expectations and the role of expectations and so on. And I, I came up, 
with this idea of the of the dichotomy between uh, the physical world and and the, the social and the social systems and made up of human beings and but then and then I kept thinking how about animals you know, you know well, I don't, or bees or I, I don't I, I'm not an expert on animals I'm another than uh, economics is about human beings no but you know do, do animals form expectations or not. Uh, uh, it's it's not uh, it's not obvious to me. So I think expect forming expectations uh, about the future, or forming expectations about what others are going to do, and so on. I think requires a, lev uh, a minimum level of intelligence. No? I think we, we 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 should agree on that. So um, well, if robots. You know, it, 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 it's 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 uh, it's a matter of degree. No, if if robots can eventually attain some uh, level of intelligence that would allow them to 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 make forecasts, okay, how however, you know, uh, primitive they are about how other robots perhaps will uh, behave, and. And that's in the interest of the robot, given the you know the objective that it has been programmed for, and so on. It should make those forecasts. Okay, so in, in that case, we will have you know uh, I guess a, 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 you know, a pre perhaps a primitive uh, um, uh, reproduction of what we see in, in human societies. But it's a question of degree. And again, I'm not an expert on cognitive science, and I don't know anything about it. But to me, it's it's. Something that it's very natural for for human beings, no? To, if, if we think about it, all many, if not all, the decisions that we make involve some kind of expectations or beliefs about what will happen in think, developments in, in in society as a whole, or what other people will be doing, and so on. No? You know, to the extent that animals or robots behave like this, you will have you may have similar phenomena. It's just tempting to think that that you could have a society of robots. Where like there will be no bubbles, for instance, um, because irrational behaviors that lead to bubbles are avoided. But, but, but then again, if robots become become behaving like humans, then then we're back to the same to the same models. The bubble that I showed you is not irrational. It is not irrational. Eh? I wanted to emphasize then, this. On this mute. So um, you can think of also irrational bubbles because just people make. Crazy expectations about the dividends that uh, stock will generate, and so on. No, that's what we would call overvaluation or undervaluation of stocks, and so on. But this was purely, purely rational. Right? Thank you. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting question, and may, I guess we should have to, st we should start thinking about it because. Well, this, there's a lot of synergies here. It's at the end, at the end of, a, 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 you know, around the corner. No, there's. Apparently. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, because in the model you have presented, your agents are supposed to do rational expectations, right? Yeah. But we, we know that humans are not only rational, and that also do some intuitive decisions in real time that are very unrational and completely biased. I'm thinking, for example, of this work from Daniel Kienman or this kind of thing. Uh, do, do you know some, some works in economy that try to model this interplay between rational behavior and uh, real-time intuitive behavior? Yes, de definitely. No, that's, a, that's a good point. Here, I have, as I said at the end, I have restricted myself to models with rational expectations because uh, economists, in particular macroeconomists like myself, we, take to, we, we think of that as a... Uh, not, not, not that we believe that uh, you know, people form expectations rationally or because in order to form expectations rationally you really need to understand each individual should understand the structure of the economy and make expectations in a way that is consistent with the outcomes of uh, an economy that has the structure that it has no so we obviously that cannot happen in the real world but it's a natural benchmark okay it's a natural benchmark in the sense that once you relax that assumption well it's the it's it's uh, wilderness no uh, you know there are many ways in which uh, expectations can be non-rational, okay? But there is plenty of work, and I mean, it's not not something that I, I have personally worked on, but in macroeconomics, many of many of my colleagues are, are working these days on models with in, in which there are deviations from rational expectations, and they involve all, all kinds of rational, in a, in a, you know, 
there are different ways of modeling this. Uh, one is you know, to, 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 to assume some costs of processing information, okay, in which case it doesn't pay you know, for individuals to be continuously you know, trying to, to understand fully the world around them because it would be too costly. There are also models in which people learn using over time, and so these are called learning models, by using some statistical, simple statistical techniques based on, 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 on accumulated data, okay? and that gradually allows them to learn, uh, to approximate, but never to fully learn the structure of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, there are any, any, many examples of, of those. I, I didn't have time to, to discuss. I them. assume that if you had this, then you cannot solve this problem analytic analytically. So maybe you in, do some multi-agent kind of simulation? Or no, there, or? There, no there, are, there are ways, in the, again, there are many uh, many examples in the literature, some of them are very simple and ad hoc, no? Uh, and in some cases, you, you, can, you can solve uh, analytically for the equilibria of, of, of those economies. In other, others, they involve, uh, you know, numerical methods. But that's true even for, in, that's also true in models with rational expectations. Not in the very simple models that I showed you today, but more complex models uh, that are nonlinear and so on. You, you, need, you need to use numerical methods to solve for, for equilibria. Of course, Having, you know, sometimes depending on, on the assumption and expectations, things may become more complicated or not. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, really, uh, kind of in the same direction. Uh, uh, this uh, aspect of rationality don't uh, irrational decisions kind of in real life pretty much drown out all the rational aspects of uh, economic theory. So um, <clears throat> to what degree can the models uh, still apply to real life when <clears throat> my, my intuition would be that ir irrational decisions just completely dominate uh, what's actually going on? Well, if they completely... <laughs> that's a very pessimistic uh, <laughs> view of the world. If you know, if everyone acts in a completely random way and completely unpredictable way, with in a way that it's close to being, I mean, there's no patterns, no no ob no objectives. I don't think we can ever hope to explain anything involving uh, the outcomes of those decisions. I mean, almost by by definition, the, yeah, the way that I guess uh, personally, and I think most of uh, economists interpret our models with rational agents is just as, a, as, a, as an approximation. You know, we hope you know, that on average, somehow, uh, average across individuals, average over time and so on, people will not deviate much from that because it would be costly. Now, of course, if you tell me that people are purposeless, you know, they have no objectives in life and so on, then nothing is costly. You know, there won't be any loss, lo, lo, losses from deviating from rational behavior. So then, you know, I'm, I'm completely <laughs> at a loss, you know. <laughs> I better f find another job. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> okay. Um, so, but the, the, one of the points that I wanted to emphasize today is even in a world with rational individuals, there can be crazy things uh, that can happen. So imagine in a world that in which individuals are crazy. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for those insights. And coming back to the machines, uh, you talk a lot about governated systems. But uh, if we start to think about these novel technologies that, uh, such as the blockchain, that the credibility is based on the abilities of the machine in being beaten. For example, uh, this, this week, for example, uh, a machine was like uh, the, the Bancor, the release of the Bancor, that's a kind of central bank for changing currents, like corrupted the, the, the Ethereum blockchain that could not support the amount of transaction. Then the price declined. But as people still expect that those technologies are important, even if it represents a small piece of the real world market governed by big heads, um, how about these ungovernated systems? What do you think and how? will these rules apply to those systems that are really based on credibility and trust on the technology? Mm -hmm. No, that's, a, that, uh, that's an interesting uh, observation. So it, it, 
I, I don't have any 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 deep thought, thoughts about about this. I think some of these I, I, I don't know uh, much about uh, any of these systems, but I, I think these are systems that um, um, have a strong network effects in which you know the the, the potential usefulness for an individual uh, uh, depends uh, very strongly on the extent to which other individuals are using, are using them. And we, we see these this network effects in many other things, you know, the, the software that, that we use, uh, not, not, not just to say the, the, the languages that we use to communicate and, and things like that. No? I mean, the, the, beyond the intrinsic value that some of these technologies may have, there is also their, the, um, the extent to which they become adopted by our other individuals. So uh, here it's another example in which expectations, you know, you may, you may want to invest, you know, in learning some of these, uh, of these options uh, if you think that, you know, you will be able to use them and that depends on the extent to which other people, other people will, will use them and so on. So it's related to this. But what, what you say, I think it's, a, it's absolutely, um, uh, it's, com pure, it's common sense, you know, that, uh, you know, some some of these systems ha are are non don't have uh, you know clear rules. There's no government that is guaranteeing its its workings and so on. So my guess is that you know this, I mean, loosely speaking, this opens the room for for a lot of indeterminacy in the sense that nothing there's no no nothing that coordinates. Um, nothing that coordinates the what because there may be many competitors you know, in many of these systems and and and, and again it, it may be in many cases it may be desirable to have just one or maybe two or three okay because if there was a huge number of them you know to the extent that there are these network effects the, you know they will, each each of them would be very 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 little useful because you know for their users um, you know, it would be hard to, 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 to find out partners that, 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 that use the same and so on. No? So I, this is one case, I mean, in the case of, 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 the case of currency, I think it's, it's, it's one, one case, I mean, why, we don't have, now we, we, have some multi, multi, we have multiple currencies in the world, but, you know, in, in, an, um, in a given economy, say in a given city, typically only one currency is used, okay? So in Barcelona, only euros are used. That, that's not completely true because people can use bitcoins, and actually nothing prevents us from, organi from having transactions in U.S. dollars or, or in Swiss francs if we want. No, but there is an agreement, okay, that you know the unit of account, okay, that in which you will set prices at the store and so on will be euros, and that's what we see. And I think some coordination for these um, objects that have a strong network effects is important, and governments. Governments can provide that coordination and the credibility, no? Um, so, um, and they they may may help eliminate this in possibility of indeterminacy. Okay, so I appreciate your attention. Just uh, adding something more, uh, you're talking about currents. Once uh, some years ago, I used to think, ah, the world might converge to a to a unified current, but. Checking the reality nowadays, I see it, it already happened. Because you see nowadays in Barcelona, you can use bitcoins, you can use, uh, you can use the, the, norm, the local currents. But in the future, I see that you might use in specific currents for each kind of thing. For example, you may use a currency for buying organic food, you may use a currency for uh, uh, having a guide, you may use a currency. But why it's a unified currency? Because fees are not high anymore and centralized in a bank. You, you're going to have now an easy platform to exchange. So it's a kind of uniform, a unique currency that can be easily traded between them. OK, no, that's a, that's a good point. Now, on, on, on this, the one thing that is impor um, important is uh, the currency in which prices are set. Okay, typically, you know, people, you know, if you study an introductory course to economics, there are the, you study the functions of money, you know? and there are many con functions, you know? the means, a means of payment, the way in which you can save uh, some, you can allocate your savings. You know? and, you know, but uh, 
what, there is one function that it, it's actually very important in, uh, even though it's a bit abstract and seems uh, strange, which is the unit of account, the, the unit in which prices are set. Okay, we don't set prices in terms of gold or we don't set prices in terms of ice cream. We turn, set prices in terms of euros, say. Okay, must here, no, must prices at least. Okay, so to the extent that the technology, the price uh, information about prices is such that you know it 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 is costly to to sh display prices in more than one currency. Okay, so the, the store around the corner, you know, the, the the person who runs that store wants to set prices in just one currency. Okay, before it was pesetas, now it's euros. Okay. So to the extent that this is the case, that currency, whatever we converge on, uh, will play an, an important role. Uh, and um, here, it's, it's critical whether the currency is the currency um, for which uh, an institution that we call the central bank has the monopoly to, to, to issue that currency. Okay? Because in that case, the central bank will through you know, a, a process that would be hard, would take a while to explain now, can influence the interest rates in terms of that currency. And that will um, affect the ability of the central bank to, to have an impact on the economy you know, in terms of uh, um, um, you know, stimulating the economy when needed or, 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 or the opposite when the economy is, 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 is growing too fast and there is inflation and so on. So that's that's uh, critical, and that's precisely the reason why I don't see, I don't cannot, even though we we seem the world, no, we talk about globalization and you know, have, uh, the, the, uh, we, all different societies seem to be converging in many dimensions. I have, I don't have the slightest um, uh, hope. I wouldn't say hope because I, no, I, I, it's not something that I would hope. But I don't, I don't, I wouldn't expect at all in the future, in the near future, to have a a, a world currency even though it would be very easy to implement, you know, world currency. Why? Because what that would imply that each uh, economy, whether it's, you know, a national economy or a, you know, a, 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 um, something like the euro area or so on, gives up its ability to, to, infl to, to respond to uh, developments that are specific to that economy. If all the economies in the world were identical, were subject to the same shocks and so on, then there would be no cost of having a single currency. But that's not the case. No? They are very, you know, different economies are very different in structure, in the kind of shocks that they are subject to, and so on. So it's very important for governments, if they want to be able to influence the economy, you know, to, be, to, 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 to have a, a, a currency for which they, they have the monopoly of, of issuing that currency. And um, you know, the introduction of these alternative currencies, you know, if they really spread, okay, and people and will become widely used and so on, may call into question that that monopoly, and may actually call into question the central bank's ability to 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 to, to have an impact on the economy. And I don't know if that's desirable or not, because you know, who controls the supply of that currency? Um, and I've heard about Bitcoin in particular, this uh, compl uh, complicated algorithm and so on. But that algorithm as far as I know, doesn't respond to, to, to developments in the economy. It's purely mechanical, you know. There's no someone, no, there's not, not, there, there isn't uh, someone behind who's thinking, okay, now it would be desirable to increase the supply or to reduce the supply and so on. So from that point of view, it's not obvious that it's desirable. From other points of view, like uh, uh, ending the, what I call the blackmail of banks, you know, banks have, are, uh, have all of us in our society and under blackmail because you know they, in addition to doing their main function, which is to 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 transfer you know uh, resources from the individuals or that want to save to those that need resources to invest and so on, no? and they could do a good job doing that. In addition to that, they really control the payment system, okay, and that's critical for the workings of society. So that means that governments cannot let banks collapse or the banking system to collapse because if the banking system collapses not only you know the bank shareholders will uh, be left with you know will become poor will lose their all their wealth but you know society will collapse because trade 
transactions will not be able to take place. No? And that's a disaster in my view. And I think from that point of view, it's great that there are these alternatives. That, uh, but you know, the same thing can be done through a central bank. The central bank could, be, um, could be, become the bank of everyone. Okay? And there wouldn't be any risk of a bank run, of any, of any, there wouldn't be a risk of insolvency and so on, because the central bank can always, will always be able to repay its debt because it can print the money. Okay, there's no, it can, a central bank cannot, it's the only, the only entity that cannot become insol insolvent or illiquid. Okay, so everything could be done through central banks, but that's not done. You know, and we don't have accounts at the central bank. We have accounts at private banks, and hence all the conflicts of interest between society and banks, in my view. That's a personal view on, on the role of banks. OK, we, have, uh, we are now running out of time. We, there is one last question, if it is short. Otherwise, we can keep discussing uh, during the snacks. Uh, thanks for, for the great talk. Very interesting to hear. So it's a, a, a really simple, I'm a bit confused by the use of uh, rational, uh, rational expectations because, uh, and in the discussion here, it was like it, it, it either be rational or uh, undeterministic, but it can also be oh. like uh, people are like biased. So they are still, uh, they don't take the rational decision, but they're a syst systematic bias. And I suppose this is, Studied also with yeah 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 so no no the, so this I want to clarify this in, so um, in all the examples I've given I, I was assuming rational expectations in what sense in what sense for instance in this sense you know this individual is forming expectations about future say output okay aggregate output in the economy and in order to form those expectations here I could have just assume. Uh, as it was done in, in the past, before the so-called rational expectations revolution, I could have assumed, look, uh, expected output for next period equals today's output. OK? It, it was what we call adaptive expectations. That's not necessarily rational, because it doesn't use all the information. It just uses a simple rule. No? Well, uh, this, yes, you can. These, these were the kinds of assumptions that were made in the past. It turns out that under those assumptions, it's harder to get this kind of multiplicity uh, that they have emphasized here. But in what sense it's rational here, for instance? Well, because when forming expectations, this individual, individual I, when forming expectations about future output, uh, this individual is assumed to understand the workings of the economy, and in fact, knows that y t plus one, okay, will be equal to x t plus one plus zt plus one, okay? And makes expectations in a way consistent to that. But you can, but the, uh, uh, even under, the, that was the, the, the one of the points that I wanted to convey, even under these rational expectations that we agree that may not happen in the real world, but even under those rational expectations, you can get this multiplicity of equilibria, this indeterminacy, and so on. With different kinds of expectations, and again, there are many different ways in which expectations can be non-rational, you get, there are cases in which those multiplicity may go away. For instance, if, Russia, if expectations were always backward looking, okay, then we, will go, we would go back to, to, to a system like the one I showed that described uh, what I said, describes the physical, physical systems. It would be, you know, it would be like this if they were backward looking. But that would be obviously people who don't want to use all the information that is, at their, uh, that is available to them in order to understand things that will affect, uh, the, the, that should affect their decisions, okay? So in that sense, they will be irrational in the sense that they, they, they are not, they don't make use of all the available information to them. But all kinds of phenomena, in some cases, when you have these not, depending on what the assumptions you make about the particular kinds of how expectations are formed, you can still get indeterminacy and multiplicity of equilibrium and so on, or not, okay? The, the, the two possibilities may exist. Okay, so it's not that necessarily that one form of expectations, rational or not, is associated with um, with this multiplicity that they have emphasized. But but the important thing is that when expectations are rational, then this multiplicity is a very natural thing that can emerge. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much for the questions and thank you again, Jordi, for your brilliant presentation. Well, thank you. And...